all starting to come in. All right, I'm gonna need somebody to operate this. Okay, there we go. All right, we got that. We got this. Shit. All right. That, give me a minute, Charlie. I'll figure this out. Okay, I'm going to stop screen sharing for just a minute just to get this thing hooked up properly. Never had this trouble before. Never had this trouble before. So we're going to have to. That's about as good as we're going to get, Charlie. My apologies. Okay. All right. I guess yeah. we're going to get that. All right. Let's get rolling. Um, okay. Welcome, everyone, um, to the gala, the complex, to the playground, to people who think. I think we're at meeting 3,693. Okay. Um, the topic tonight. Is how the com how the communists defeated fascism brought an end to World War II and will defeat fascism again today. Now this is a two-part program. The first part is historical, uh, and the second part are, covers contemporary events in the United States. So if you're not interested in history, just sit and take a while. And then tune in when the second part regarding conflict between communism and fascism. And for one reason or another, I started watching a great many contemporary movies, which I had access to, regarding the great patriotic war as it's called in the, uh, in Russia. And uh, excuse me, can you, excuse me, we can't hear you. Can you speak clear, clearly, more clearly into the microphone? How's that? Okay, that's better. Um, anyhow, um, I was watching these movies, which are for the most part not fiction. Yeah regarding events that took place uh, during the war in the um, East during World War II. And I was amazed at how very, very little I actually did know about what took place there. And as undertook an adventure to fill that void, and hopefully I can bring everyone here up to date uh, regarding what took place. Um, there are battles uh, that took place in the Eastern portion of the conflict, which we don't even know about in World War II, but we'll cover that tonight. Okay, next slide. Hang on, Charlie. We're gonna get quicker here in a minute, but I'll get it, I'll get it advanced right now. <laughs> Come on, it's Damn it, come on. Oh, there you go. Okay, for many Americans, the war begins with the D-Day landing in France. Uh, France, of course, is in June of 1944. That's about where the war begins for us. On the Eastern Front, however, in Russia, there already have been three years of war. Three years of war, which began in June of 1941. Uh, it even began a few years before that. But this will be the primary focus of our discussion here tonight. Next slide, please. Okay, and now we'll go back. We'll retreat in the past as to when the, the historical uh, aspects of this location. And as I said, I was watching movies. So one of the premier movies that I, some of you may have seen already is considered something of a classic 
ice size panel of the ice, um, which concerns uh, the Holy Roman Empire uh, and the, which was defeated the Teutonic Knights by Prince Alexander Nevsky. Can you move that picture with all the people out of the way, please? I don't know how to do it. Oh, all right. Um, okay, so this is the movie on the 13th century Catholic there. You need double three. Yes. This concerns two warriors who were the best of friends and competed to win the hand of Novgorod maiden Olga. And she declared that she would marry the man who proved himself greatest in battle. Okay, the guy, next slide, please. The guy in the middle looks like Cruz job. Okay, now, German foreign policy. Uh, this is our 20th century, we're back in. In the 1930s, was essentially worked to restoring uh, Creating a great space, autarchy in continental Europe. Um, Germany had been stripped of territory at the end of World War I and sought to have that restored. And that was part of the reason for the actions here tonight. Anyhow, they had something of a territorial imperative as a matter of their foreign policy. Next slide. Okay, in Hitler's mind, here's where we get into conflict. Communism was a major enemy of Germany, a man, an enemy he often mentioned in his book by Kemp. He says the problem of how the future of German nation can be secured is the problem of how Marxism can be exterminated. And he claimed, he maintained that regarding Russia, and the communist, he said, oh, you only have to kick in the door and the rotten, rotten structure will come crashing down. We'll see later on that this assessment probably resulted in his downfall and the, the dire consequences that took place for the German army with this perception <laughs> somewhat that there's one big battle, and it would be no problem whatsoever to get rid of the world of communism. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, also, during this period, uh, the, the fascists and the communists first really engaged one another in, during this period of the Spanish Civil War. Uh, the Nationalist Republic forces, uh, uh, the, the Nationalists were trying to expel the uh, lefties from the government and sought the aid of the, the Nazis in this regard. Uh, and the communists were assisted by Russia. There was basically a period of not, there was some, actually, a number of years ago, we, uh, next slide, we covered this topic. We had veterans. Of what is of, of who fought in this war at the college complexes, and what and there was a national international brigade called the Abraham Lincoln um, uh, force, uh, and there you can see um, about forty thousand men and women from fifty-two countries volunteered to fight for communism in Spain. Okay, next one. Again. Uh, German foreign policy, uh, they sought territorial expansion for the Riebensraum, living space. Hitler believed it was Germany's right to seize cup of global land. Since Russia, uh, it belonged to people in Russia uh, who were not, uh, he regarded as slothful and incompetent and unworthy to possess it. So, they needed land, and so why not take it from people who were 
of, of subhuman status. Next slide. His plan, a lot of people aren't aware of this, but we're to separate the Slavic people into four German territories. Um, and with cancellation altogether of any memory of the country of Russia. Okay. There's no way we can get rid of those things. Outside. I wouldn't know how to do that. Where's our guy? I don't know where he's going. Oh, I well, just use the mouse. I don't, again, I don't know how to do that. All right, I, let's go on. All right, now prior to the war, um, Germany and Russia made a treaty, a non-aggression pact, and they agreed to take no, no, no military action against one another for the next 10 years. Now, there's an awful lot written about this and a lot of misconstructions regarding it. There's some people that claim communists are fascists or Nazis and, and communists are fascists. That's not the case. Each country was planning, probably expecting to go to war against each other. Hitler wanted to be free to pursue military endeavors in Western Europe, and the Russians sought to build up their military. Uh, for what they both sides simply basically agreed not to pursue each other for a certain period of time for the immediate future. But, you know, well, there were different things um, regarding territorial imperatives. We'll get into that next. Ready right for the next slide, Charlie? Yes. Now, what did the Russia during this time period, I covered this in another program, the history of the factory, was that the Soviet Union took the opportunity during the period of peace, um, at least for the temporary period of peace, to relocate 1,500 factories. They moved them to the east along with 16 million people employed in them. This was to be anticipating an invasion of Russia. And the idea was, um, and they also established um, 3,500 new factories. They were gearing our economy up um, for a military conflict war in, in essence. Okay, next slide, please. It's coming. It, 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 it's coming. Come on. It froze. It froze. There's a good movie, Tanks for Scots for Stalin. Actually, it is, and it's actually a lighthearted movie. What happened in that episode is um, you have to road test things that they designed in the tank. Just and got you have to protest it. Okay, Charlie, it's so, good. Um, Next slide. What there. the guy did was take the factory, two of the tanks out of the factory, and they drove it a thousand kilometers to Moscow for the May Day Parade. And they had very seductive walking away. Okay, now another bit of this regarding it. Um, a Hitler plan, despite the treaty agreement, and the launched uh, Operation Barbarossa. Um, which actually sets the record. And I can be, I don't think I can be challenged on this, but more forces were committed to this endeavor than in any theater of war in the history of humanity. This was war out of an incredible scale. Now they, they used the term, they call it Operation Barbarossa because of the Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, who was asleep in a cave, a cave um, in the mountains. And he, when he woke up, he would come to the aid of Germany. So they, they called the, the invasion of Russia by the Germans was Operation Barbarossa. Next. 
And what do they put together? Uh, these figures may not mean a lot to you, but they put together 104 infantry, 19 Panzer uh, motorized units. This is, they all together, something like 7,000 armored vehicles, almost 4,000 tanks, uh, over 4,000 aircraft, 23,000 artillery pieces. Um, in addition, around 700,000 horses. This easily had to be, um, in terms of soldiers, we're talking about three and a half, an army of three and a half million German soldiers were assembled for Operation Barbarossa. Um, okay, next slide. Right. Oh, um, now the, the, the basic strategy of the Germans, and many of you are familiar with this term, the Blitzkrieg or Lightning War. And this consisted of a surprise attack. Uh, they normally don't even announce that uh, a declaration of war, simply commenced uh, with an attack. And it was a use, they use an overwhelming. Um, uh, mechanical force, essentially tanks. Tanks originally had been divided up in infantry units, so many tanks each unit. What they did was assemble all of the tanks in one unit. And then you had to coordinate tank, tanks, artillery, infantry, and aircraft, all in one concerted coordinated effort. Now required significant organization that had everybody work together and came follow the same timing and so forth. However, by this means, it generally would overwhelm an opposing force. As you see there, the uh, is a uh, uh, Stuttgart dive bomber. They had the latest technology. Uh, what makes that dive bomber unique? Is that like on the other planes or bombers, it was designed to slow dive very close to the intended target with almost ac total accuracy and precision. And it wasn't much good in other realms of, of warfare, but if for, let's say you wanted to take out a particular target, this is in the days before we had rockets and so forth, uh, this was the means of taking out, a, let's say there was a pillbox or a tank at the road or something of that nature, you could target it. And this is very devastating form of warfare. Okay, they have one of these, I believe they used to in the Museum of Science and Industry. Yeah, they do. All right, next. Now, one of the things that's often talked about in this conflict now, Hitler launched Operation Barbarossa, but it, this is one conflict that to me is kind of unique. There is a separate topic called military plunders. And it comes up more and more possibly than any other battle or concerted collective segment of war is which the blunders that were made uh, in World War II by the Germans, and in particular uh, by Adolf Hitler. The German staff were reluctant ever to challenge him. Some extent could be say, said that the generals were reluctant to challenge Joseph Stalin. However, I must admit that the decisions made by Adolf Hitler and against the advice of these generals, certainly it accelerated the defeat of Germany in World War II. It certainly is a factor that has to be taken into consideration. All right, next slide. Now, they launched Operation Barbarossa on June 22nd, 1941. There's a 1,200 mile border. And as I say, they had 
3.8 million soldiers, mechanized troops um, who advanced. Now, what did, how did the Russians respond to this? And they did as they had historically in the past, what is called the scorched earth, scorched earth policy. That means you deny the in, in, incoming army all access to electricity, communications, railroad bridges, and anything. You destroy it totally. Villages were burned to the ground. And uh, railroads were torn up. We'll see some photos of this. Everything is destroyed to, that, so that the incoming army has absolutely nothing. Now, it's very standard in what he studies warfare is that armies, especially invading armies or armies on the move, engage in what is called foraging, in which you go out and you get supplies, so forth. Let's say you're in a rural area, you may get animal husbandry, get to help yourself to a cow or a pig or something. But this precluded this from happening at all by the German soldiers who were invading Russia. Next slide. There you can see what you do to the railroad system, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But they ripped the railroads up all together. Now, why this is crucial, because an army is advancing east into Russia. It's got to go quite a long way. And how do you supply that, that army? By rail. This is 1941. There are some use of trucks. Uh, there aren't even very a road system in Russia. So the rails were important. And if you deny the invading army the use of the rail system, you make it a very difficult problem uh, to supply that army. And armies used an enormous amount of goods, hundreds of tons of materials every single day, both food, uh, Okay, whatever you guys are ready. Thank you. All right. We're, um, so that's what I mean. You will deny the next slide. One of the things they did, this is in the Ukraine, uh, the Nyper Dam, said this was the most powerful hydroelectric plant in Europe. And they took eight years to build it. And they destroyed it to preclude the in, what Germans from having any and getting any electricity. Uh, actually, there was another thing that the Russians did. I read that was, I don't know to what extent this took place. Now, certain times they would not destroy a very nice building or a castle or something like that, anticipating that it would be converted into a headquarters of the German army. But what they did was put bombs on a delayed fuse in these buildings. So that if, when their Germans later on the site them, the building would suddenly one day explode. All right, next slide. Now, along with um, the uh, scorched shirt, with that the rest of the peasants in the in Russia all were constructed. And this was an ongoing activity into the uh, guerrilla warfare, partisan army. Um, sometimes in Lithuania, they were called Forest Brothers. So even <laughs> though you had burned your village, they would go and live in the forest and they were equipped by the government, the government, the Russian government, with arms and guidance, training, and so forth. But you were expected to be served uh, after you burned your village, your farm, killed your livestock. You were uh, expected to enlist in the uh, partisans. Next one, please. Next. There's a photo of some of these people serving in it. Grandpa got his, either his daughters or granddaughters. Okay, next one. Uh, 
Should be one more. You skip over one. I get too much. All right, go ahead. Go forward. Right there. All right. Now another thing <laughs> after <clears throat> that has to be taken in account in the conflict in, in the Germans have countered. And I'll summarize this as dust, but and distance. Um, <clears throat> there is not a, there was not at the time an extensive network of paved roads in Russia. As a matter of fact, leading into the city of Moscow, the capital, there were only three paved roads. And if you do not have paved roads, the end result is, is creating a dust. And there's a red granite like dust. Now, this is the enemy of any internal combustion engine, which needs clean, filtered air and tanks in particular. You are operating a highly mechanized military force. And you've got this the one thing you do not want are, are dust being generated clouds and clouds of dust. Now this was this was something they could not avoid. There were very few paved roads, and even the army traveled at times simply over open country. And so it dust was terrible. The other thing is <coughs> the Soviet Union uh, in October, in the fall, and in the spring. Uh, and I don't know if my correction pronunciation is correct because Rasputin. Rasputin, but you have rains, and it would rain for about a solid month. And it, the roads were, of course, dirt roads, and with the end result of which was impassable mud. And your vehicles would simply get plugged into this. We'll see some photos. And the other thing is, is distance. Uh, it's an enormous country. Uh, now you think about the conflict in the east, the, the countries in the uh, relatively close proximity, and it's just the opposite in distance. Now, that, that means th this is a factor that is, is crippling. If you, you, you're supposed to have, actually, it, it even causes problems because your infantry soldiers, they're not mechanized. They're walking. And you have tank, or to some extent, uh, vehicles that they could use. But you have to get your, your, your infantry keep up with your tanks. And they've got to cover a lot of distance. It's about a thousand kilometers from the border to Moscow in the Soviet Union. And you have to get all the supplies over those distances. So it causes enormous problems. Distance is the enemy um, in this regard. So there you can see uh, some of the vehicles that were mired in muck and mud. And essentially, all conflict was put out of business action during the spring and fall rains. OK, next one. I got to do this real quick. Let's go. Tim. Come on. Okay. One other thing that's always amazed me, a lot of people don't realize is that we think the German army was in fact mechanized with the latest technology. However, 70, 80% of it was horse drawn. They depended on horses. They also had a problem was that they got in the orchard for some reason. I don't know much about raising horses, but somehow the German horses didn't like eating Russian grass. So oh. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but that was the case. Anyhow. Too much vodka. Uh, Too much vodka. Yeah, whatever. Oh. Anyhow, it, they were still dependent upon horses. Uh, <laughs> When the situation became uh, conditions, they were surrounded, whatever, 
they actually became the, the food for the troops. Anyhow, next slide. I talked about the railroads a little bit. Um, the other thing about supplying you know, your troops and invading force of Russia, the German and the Russian railroads are of a different gauge. Uh, the Germans followed the British standard of four feet eight and a half, whereas in Russia, the gauge was five feet, some places even larger, and even some places even shorter, 3.6. But that meant that, and none of the steam engines, you can't take a steam engine from one gauge and transfer it to another. You can maybe change boxcar wheels, but, but you're not going to change a steam engine. So all the engines that you would come to certain the border, and you'd have to have all new engines and probably transfer any cargo into new boxcars or freight or flat cars. A tremendous delay and bottleneck to any conflict when you need <coughs> hurry. And then there's this delay. All right, next one. The other thing that happened during the war, and this is getting a little bit ahead of it, because I will speak about specific battles, but the, the campaign was launched actually in 1941. They were late, the Germans, June 22nd, to be specific. Um, a date that is well known among yeah. other people, I hardly know among anyone like such as in the United States. But they got off to war late. And as I said, there was this, the wind, the wind, uh, fall rains, and the Germans did not achieve their objectives at the outset of the war. And that's there suddenly. They found themselves in December on the outskirts of Moscow. They advanced a considerable distance, and the temperature suddenly went, it snowed. <laughs> and then the next night, the temperature dropped to five degrees. And the following night, the temperature dropped to minus 30, 40. minus 40. The German soldiers were not equipped in any way for this climate. Um, it needless to say, probably affected about one half of the army. I mentioned blunders and getting supplies over distances. And now you can see how crucial a mistake this can be. They, they assigned a priority to shipping other armaments bullets and shells and so forth, replacement parts for tanks, and neglected to send the winter gear. As, as opposed to this, the Russian army went out of its way to design conceivably the finest winter gear that one could find anywhere. Um, I'd like to have one of their winter coats. They had mittens and so forth. Uh, the Germans also made mistakes. You had boots. You need boots that are larger so you can and wear two pairs of socks. You don't use nails in boots because they freeze and that will cause frostbite. Mistakes like that. Okay, next slide. Okay, now one other thing, a technological advantage yeah. There was a the one of the aspects of this war also was the type of tanks. This is a central feature we'll see of this conflict, and the Russians came along and designed what is known as the T-34 and considered by anyone 
in military historians um, and spec experts in this area um, as the best, the very best all around vehicle um, for mechanized warfare. Um, they produced, they were, they were simple, easy to repair. They also ascertained that Russians were pretty smart. They knew that if you sent a tank out into battle, it probably would only last a day or two that sooner or later it would get shot and be put out, out of commission. So they said, let's not put too much quality control into this because the life expectancy of these, these, uh, these warfare, these uh, vehicles is not long. But they came up with a very basic design and they use it to war. All right. <laughs> okay, there's some more about the D-34 manufactured in the Ukraine, which was the center, by the way, of heavy industry in the USSR. And pretty much in the armaments of German. Now, I mentioned the Forest Brothers that you can see invading armies. I just thought I'd toss this in. Uh, some people looked upon the invading army of Russians as liberators. They were not receptive to communism or Stalin, Joseph Stalin, or the Bolsheviks. And so they welcomed the Germans as liberators. Next slide. How long did that take? We welcomed the, well, until the, the liberators left. I mean, there were people that collaborated with the invaders. And then they then things turn differently once the invaders leave. And you better get out of town. If you collaborated, if somebody invades my country and you cooperate with them and you make friends with them, that's what happens when they're no longer around. People don't like you too much. Well, depends. What do you mean? You can't figure out who's, who's you can't figure out what army is in, in town. They still were invaders. And the thing is whether you welcome the invaders or not. Or do you oppose them? It's your your choice. Uh you, let's hope you make it directly, you know. Um yes some and now you actually have to ask yourself, didn't now you're Ukrainians. I like this. Good I'll get it to your question. If you were in the Ukraine, Adolf Hitler, I just showed you there, and he said Ukrainians are non humans. Now they take over your country. Are you gonna be friendly with these guys? They wanna take your land. They wanna make you slaves. They don't regard you as having any status as a human being, and you welcome them? Why would you do that? I don't know. This girl did. Let's next slide. I am a one pull at a time. One pull at a time, please. I mentioned tanks. Now the Germans. I love this. The Germans did just the opposite. They put all their money on high tech, on technology. We see how well technology is working tonight. Anyhow, they made these things. That basic thing were the Panthers. Panthers, they had one, two, three, and four, but they came up with these Tiger things. They didn't even approved on it. They came up with something called the King Tiger. These are massive pieces of warfare. 60 tons. I've heard they even went up to 68 tons. The biggest gun you could find anywhere that could be made. Armor 100 millimeters thick. Um, granted, it, 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 actually, there, that's what I mean, but there were design flaws. It wasn't any good 
in the terrain of Russia. You may not realize it, but the treads on this tank uh, are too, too narrow. If you're going to operate within the terrain of the so Russia, you need wide treads like they put on the T-34. So it made it kind of ineffective. You couldn't keep one of these things running for more than a day or two. They sent them off in the combat, even knowing that they were going to break down. They caught fire. Things wouldn't work. Same thing happened. The Germans over-designed stuff. And, and uh, we saw about that winter thing. Every year you got, you're in the middle of winter, it goes 40 below zero. So everything like this mechanized is going to freeze. It's you're going to they had to burn fires at night to keep that tank going. Yeah, same with artillery, bullets, uh, handguns. Everything froze. It didn't work. But particularly if it was over designed with too many complicated moving parts. Germans did that all the time. Next one. Oh, this is kind of a a unique thing to this warfare, uh, the Russians came up with this. Actually, somebody did. They had artillery shells, which were defective. So one worker in the factory, they designed this thing called Katusha's. It's considered the most fearsome weapon. All those rockets would fire one after another, a few seconds apart. So if you were on the receiving end of this, it would cover the whole area. This was a, the worst type of artillery coverage you can imagine. Anyhow, the Germans were never able to copy this. They tried. There's some kind, something about the type of powder they used in those shells. Next slide, please. We're on the code. Oh, now, as I said, the Germans always go for the high tech. They had this cannon that they used for siege warfare. Next slide. You got to get moving here. Okay. Uh, Snipers, a lot is written about this. Over 2,000 female uh, Soviet snipers were, were on the front. Uh, long range shooters, uh, making life difficult for the average German soldier and particularly officer corps. So these snipers, yes, there is validity to the story of the snipers active in this theater of the war. Next. Uh, this was a rule issued by Stalin, invading army rule 227, not one step back. There was some theory that if you would step back, you'd get shot or your family would get in trouble. I don't know if that's all that valid. Uh, it was ever enforced, probably just something to instill that um, you, that you didn't get they, they, they can run out of the battlefield. All right, there you can see some of the snipers. Okay, next. Uh, they, the one thing, uh, the Russians were fortunate that you come up with among some very good commanders, unquestionably General Zukov. And he came in up with a strategy. Now this was, now remember, you're fighting an enemy who's got mechanized vehicles and wants big, wide open spaces. Tanks want room to move. They go 20, 30, 30, 50, up to 50 miles per hour. They shoot on the run. That's how they fight. So he says, no, we're gonna fight in the cities. We're gonna hug the enemy. And you're gonna have to keep them within 50 yards of each other. And we're gonna, we're gonna have street to street combat. They fought building by building, floor to floor. They, they took buildings, high-rise buildings, and put artillery in them, machine guns, and the Germans were expected to take, take like high-rise buildings. And even if they, they, were, they did, there was an entire battle in one factory, an enormous tractor factory. And that went on for months. Every day, I guess they just showed up and fought one another. One side had a one day, now the guys would take it over, but this was a strategy. Now, it also is to teach tanks because in tanks in close proximity are targets, very easy targets 
they handheld weapons, tank, tank guns. So you don't want to bring your tanks into the city. So they were of no value to the German army. Next. Here's something just some propaganda. Since the Ukraine's in the news, um, the Ukrainians, as I said, they're classified as Unterbench, subhumans. I don't know why you'd like them, but uh, they particularly wanted the Ukraine because it was a breadbasket of Europe. Uh, they had the richest lands. That's just the wood cut from their propaganda. Next slide, we'll move on here. Okay, very quickly, during the war, there were three campaigns. There are some, they call them campaigns of warfare. The first one was north to Leningrad. They had the second campaign of the Germans were, were to take Moscow. And the third campaign was to the south into the Kiev uh, to Odessa to get uh, oil. Um, and that's where you engage Stalingrad. So that is the basic outline of the war all together. 41, 42, 43. Next slide. Leningrad. Leningrad, the Germans did not invade the city. They surrounded it and um, the, they invoked the siege. It turned out we had an under to die siege and the Leningrad never surrendered. They were still supplied with food. It's a city about the size of Chicago uh, by a, a, a frozen lake. Uh, so they had a certain amount of food, terrible starvation and hardship, but they would be in the middle of the spirit of the communists was not to give in to the, to the uh, German, the fascist invaders. All right, next one. The other one, the other campaign I said was towards Moscow. The Germans got within 20, 20 meters of uh, Moscow. They actually got to commuter line, a station, a rail station, suburban rail station, but they could never advance any further. That's when the winter hit them. And not only did it turn cold, but guess what happened? General Zhukov, I talked about, had a whole 100,000 Siberian troops that he, he had them shipped over to Moscow. And that's who you see in portion there. These were trained, regular army, not new recruits, totally equipped Siberian troops who thought it was just wonderful that <laughs> It's 30 below zero, the Germans are freezing. And who does he send loose but the Siberians on the Germans? So that's what happened in Moscow. They had a parade even on the seventh anniversary. That's what I mean. They marched from there to the combat. Uh, next slide. And the third campaign was for Stalingrad. Um, this is, this was, this warfare on a scale that no one can no one can compare. This was just kill, kill and merciless fighting, hand to hand combat every day, uh, just uh, attrition. Once in a while, you end up in conflicts that become wars of attrition. This was a war of attrition of its very worst kind. They never Germans were never able to get all of all of the city. It it served it was along a river and the were never able to totally take the city. Um, and, um, and now what happened was not only did they not take the city, but as I mentioned, reinforcements, the Russians broke out and surrounded the Germans who were invading Stalin, Stalingrad. And they inflicted, they defeated that army, the sixth army of the Germans. And that was the first army. Ger Germany rarely saw a defeat, rarely if ever saw a retreat, but an entire army was surrendered to the Russians 
at the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, and this was an incredible event. Think of all the countries that fought Germans, France, England, Belgium, Greece, everybody, nobody inflicted a defeat like this. And, and the Germans had, Hitler had no explanation. It was a, it just a terrible result of their mismanagement. Okay, next slide. Oh, there you just see the uh, the um, eight hundred thousand German soldiers were taken captive. Um, captivity in Russia was not nice, and you were not likely to survive it. Only five thousand ever returned to Germany after the war. Next, wasn't that in the fifties? Yes, nineteen fifty-three. Uh, after Stalin died. So they were prisoners for a long time. Yes. Okay. Now, the very last conflict, we saw the campaigns, but um, the Germans wanted to redeem themselves because of having lost this army. So their next campaign were to attack the Russians at of all places in the camp, uh, city of Kursk, it turns out. But they put together a massive army. Um, they threw everything they had, and they were going to redeem themselves from this loss by putting a attacking with everything they virtually had. Um, a massive attack, and that's what I mean. Uh, the, now. The Russians knew they were coming and they prepared a defense like you wouldn't believe. They actually had 13 separate levels or, or stages of defense so that if the Germans broke through the first defensive line, they would have to go get their way to the second. So they actually made 13. And when they made a defensive line, is There'd be landmines, there'd be artillery guns, all kinds of things would welcome you if you were an invading, invading soldier. Um, tank guns, pillboxes, they could take tanks and bury them in the dirt and use them as, as uh, artillery, uh, anti-tank weapons. They barbed wire all sorts of little fun things to make it difficult for an invading force. Uh, but that's what I mean. They got they put their act together and they knew they were coming. And that's all right, next thing. That's what we talk about. It's the Battle of Kus. Actually, it's a couple separate battles. But the German Germans had committed 80% of their entire armed forces. This is all their entire army from all over. They meant business. They were going to do a number on these Russians. And one big, they always believed in one big battle and the war. You could be mistaken in that regard, but they thought this was it. One big battle and we win. All right. But there you can see what, what happened. Actually, what happened is. I, I put it this way, two, two armies of tanks, the two units of tanks of about a thousand tanks each stumbled on one another. But anyhow, actually, this is actually true. There were several conflicts, but the one thing that happened was one tank army literally stumbled into the other one on a big open field. And they just went to it. There was no planning, no commands. Nobody knew what was going on. It's just like you're walking down the street and suddenly you, you, you confront the enemy. There's no, there's, no, there's no battle plan. Nobody was in charge of it. So you got 
two enormous tank forces with the latest tanks going after one another all day long. That's what I mean. This is this an incredible, incredible warfare. Tanks flowing up there and there going on. So that's what I mean. It was total mayhem. Next, next thing. All right, this is this is some of the memorials that they have. We're almost done. Next slide. Another part you can see. And here we have cannons and so forth, but they their memorials can recognize the effort of tankers. Next slide. Okay, uh, th that's what I mean. 6,000 tanks um, confronted uh, um, in, in the Battle of Kursk. That's 6,000 tanks in one place, each of them trying to shoot each other. <laughs> the great shootout. And there you can see uh, 239 personnel got the title Hero of the Soviet Union for Valor. And there I was looking at that photo, and that woman has one on. So I'd like to know, I, I have no idea what she did, but that's quite a distinction and honor. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, what followed after this, we don't waste a lot of time. The Russians, having defeated the Germans uh, thus far, they came up with their own. We saw Operation Barbarossa. They came up with their own called Operation Bergazia, a German army named after a general. And, the, and they started the offensive moving west. Next slide. Who was that named after? Bergazia. Um, they that's uh, continuing. They were on the offensive ever since the Battle of Kursk. That was the turning point of the war. And that is when the defeat of Germany really took place. All this operation by Grazion and everything subsequent to that, that is when Germany Effectively, they were in retreat. They never mounted anything after that, an offensive action anywhere. And they were on running their way back, back to Germany. Okay, they crossed the river uh, into Germany. They gave awards to whoever, they, they gave a prize to whatever soldier got there first. Next slide. There you can see Berlin. Next slide. Um, and now the Hitler. And the bunker says, what's going on here? Uh, he actually had some notion. He had a maps and things that are fictional units. Um, he was giving commands to and, and so forth. Actually, I like his thing. His thing that, like, why did he lose the war? Is that he was, and like this, he said, he was surrounded by traitors. That's why he lost. All right, next slide. Um, and there you can see the Reichstag and the end of the war we brought about by the Russians. Okay, next slide. Okay, if you want to have some fun, this is the only movie made in America that I know that concerns this episode of the human endeavor called the North Star. It's available. I believe it's not even under copyright. Kind of a sappy movie, but still worth, worth the view. All right, next one. There's all kinds of movies. They're available free, coming from out of Russia. They even have TV series about the Great Patriotic War. They're very interesting. Some are in English, some subtitled. All kinds of interesting stories. Uh, tankers about a husband and wife who are in their own tank. <laughs> okay, that's a creepy story. But anyhow, um, Next slide. You you can find all kinds of documentaries on YouTube free that would cover this. It's usually why I, I don't recommend books because you want to see photos of what was going on. Movies that were taken by the photographic department of each army. Next. All right, quickly. Fighting, we saw there how the communists defeated fascism. And what are we going to have to do here in the United States to defeat fascism? 
or if you like, I need to defeat communism. All right, Next, the battle lines are drawn. Um, it can happen here, either way. Um, and I, I long said that I had personal knowledge that there are evolved communists and socialists operating with impunity in the government of the United States. Anyhow, next one. Now, what are the kids reading in stores? This is not even think, look, there we go, the one. See, so look at this. The coming socialist revolution. We own the future of uh, uh, why America needs socialism. This is the kind of thing that you see the students, the next generation is buying into. Next one. Okay, uh, is another presence of spies. What about the spies next door? I, this is recent history here. Bush had to throw out a dozen spies operating around the US. And then Obama kicked out 35 of them. This war is still going on. There's Maria Putina. They threw her in jail. Look at that. She's got an umbrella. There's a rifle. All right, next slide. Foreign affairs. Yeah, what kind of foreign affairs do we have? Foreign affairs from Moscow. Come on, next slide. The restrictions on freedom of assembly. Where's Bob Matter? Yeah, these guys, they don't look like they're causing any trouble. Really, look at that. Next slide. Yeah, I went to the same time. We're authorizing rioting. That's what I mean. Next slide. Um, here's another thing talking about the groups there, just like Adolf Hitler did, artificially, artificially defined populations. He defined the Slavic people as an artificially defined population. You know, and there are some people that think they can do they can do the same thing here in the United States. Next slide. Okay, talk about infiltrate socialist infiltrated government. They think. <laughs> Don't tell me that communists haven't infiltrated our Congress. Look at this. Yeah, next one. Um, and this is concerns the election. Of course, it was an effort uh, to be, uh, defeat that. Um, this bring in socialism. They couldn't do it legally. Next. There you go. This is the largest growing organization, membership wise, in the United States. Democratic Socialists, they have meetings, two, three hundred people. A quorum is 140 people in my chapter. A quorum, they have a vote. Okay, now we got that socialist appeal. Next slide. Build back. <laughs> oh, talk about a five year plan. We had our own. Build back better. Look at that. Look at these guys. All right, next slide. There we go. We are all socialists now. That's Newsweek. That's Newsweek for you. Next. Oh, this. I I go to their Zoom meetings. Yeah, eco socialists. Let's take ecology and save the earth. You know, a Green New Deal. All right, talk about a plan. All right, that's the manifesto. What's next? Oh, get the children. Let's just like they did. There you saw grandpa and the daughters. You got to have the kids, man. And can, can script them, get them when they're young enough. All right, next. Oh, global warming. You know, who follows that? A lot of hooey. Next. Yeah, control of the government. Is there a deep state? Is the government controlled really on the 13th floor of the State Department? You probably don't know about that, do you? All right, next. The surveillance state. How many times during the course of the day are you are you picture taken? Next. Oh, I just came across this. You can you can't even carry a telephone. You gotta you gotta put it in one of these. Envelopes. 
And that way they can't follow each other. Next. And curriculum. We, there's all kinds of debate about this is right now and uh, what goes on in, in the classroom, the subject matter, that either one side or the other is thought communism or fascism. Next. Regulation of everyone, at least according to the fascists seem to think so. Um, is that really the case? Next. Regulation of all commerce. This was just a program that was running. It's very implementing socialist uh, policies. Next. And the outcome is yet to be determined here in the state, but the conflict apparently seems to be continuing just like it did back during the war. Thank you very much. Oh. Okay, um, Charlie, are you ready to take questions? Yeah. All right. Uh, my first question to you is, if communism did so well in World War II, why would you explain its abject failure now in Ukraine? I'm not certain that what do you mean by abject failure in the Ukraine? Well, I mean, they're not, they're, they're uh, Putin came in and invaded and there's all kinds of problems with the Russian army, logistics, uh, you know, manpower. No, the country's not your, with your them. Your assertion is invalid. They have many features of socialism and communism. Um, and what do, you, what do you mean it isn't working? Capitalism is the one that doesn't work. No, how many how many businesses succeed for more than a year or two? How many businesses fail on any given day? I just read during the week that the one company, the media companies, laying off that ten thousand employees. That's a system that works. That is a company that works. Name a company that has been around ten years. Try. It. Try and find one. Try and find you, you can count on your hand. How many big names? Big names All right. Companies, you know? Let's move on. Uh, Jake's got the next question. I'm so. Years. All right, Jake, you're, you're on mute and ask a question. Okay, can you hear me now? We will. Can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, just. Just my, my my answer to the last question it was ridiculous it was a ridiculous uh, question. Putin, uh, Russia under Putin is not is no longer communist. So that doesn't make the, the the question doesn't make sense. Anyway, my question is my question is um, what was my question? Um, let me think what my question is. Hold on a minute. Um. Yeah, yeah. I just my my question my question is where what what is it what is your source for all this historical information? Where are you getting it from? Where am I getting it from? Yeah. The standard histories of the war. I well, mean, I guess I guess my I guess my my I guess my real I, I guess my real question. Did you find any of these facts invalid? I mean, what? <laughs> military is, history is pretty straightforward. There was nothing that terribly interpretive about that. Now you can in military history, I didn't want to talk about this. You can say get these questions like, what if? What if what if the army did this or what if the general did that? But I never got into any of those types of questions. I gave you straightforward facts. What what fact did I give? That you think is questionable, Jake? Okay. Well, my, my what, what what's questionable? What's questionable is you may you made it sound you made it sound like Stalin won the war by himself, and that's that's inaccurate. He won he won the war in conjunction with the Allies. All right. Now I will answer your question. To what extent did Joe Stalin and the Russians defeat? Now, there was no presence of the United States during all the things I showed you. All those years, 
until June of 1944. Operation Bagration was already implemented. In yeah, the British, where were they? Now they, they were convoys of supplies. And there's many, it's read tragically, they had to run the gauntlet, and not many of these vessels made it. But even, even Joseph Stalin, it was one of the conferences they had, like in Yalta, that are you ever going to fight this war? Okay. And I asked the same thing Americans, are you ever going to fight this war? He's losing. Millions, the, the Russians lost 25 million people. Oh, sure. And where the Americans, not one American had perished in that conflict. Okay, who's next from the floor? Sure, we didn't, we, we didn't get in, sure. We didn't get in until, until the bombing of, bombing of Pearl Harbor, sure. All right, Jake, we're going to move on. Who next? Okay. On Ukraine, um, the famine in the, in the 30s that was imposed with millions of dollars, I found agricultural Can I ask a question? And, yeah, you'll be in that. You'll be sure. So, the, so uh, my if you think if you think the German shot the human rights of war I, 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 I even the dumbest Ukrainian would know that. better than that. Now, certainly there's so nothing great. that can justify what Joseph Stalin's domestic policies were regarding that country. But if you think some Nazi is better, is going to like you, and is your friend, you, I, I, I'm no, sorry, I, I, I would I, not. That's not my point. They, they weren't. They, yeah, you're saying, like, why would they welcome Germans? No, I said there was a group within Ukraine that uh, was, you know, was welcoming. Uh, yeah, and they, what kind of people welcome Nazis? <laughs> oh, how oh, wonderful. Kind of, we are, we are now under the control kind of, of Nazis. What kind of people recognize uh, hey, that's crazy. The Russians, oh, oh, hey, we're under the Nazi They love us. Okay. They're wonderful people. Oh, all right, Charlie. Charlie. Well, the any, any Jamal, any Ukrainian can get for a dollar right. by the by that Kaiser's book and read okay, it. Okay, Charlie, we're to the next question, please. Go ahead. Where do you think you think he wrote a book? He said, all right, but if you all right, Charlie, it. next question. Didn't, didn't uh, Russia come in at the end of World War II so that they can take over Eastern Europe and East Germany? They come over at the end of the war. I, I don't know, know what that means, takeover. Huh? What does that mean, takeover? The U.S. is trying to stop them from doing that. They took over uh, all these other countries. Eastern Europe, yeah, the Ukraine. And... Yeah. So who are the U.S. is to say, what? They were active in those countries. Was the U.S. active in any of those? So I, what, wait a minute. You had nothing to do with the country. You're not even in the war. And you're going to decide what happens. I ask I turn that question back on you. Who are the U? Who is the United States to come in and say what do Romanians do? Why? Well, I saw that. They, they made the Soviet uh, Union. Okay. Uh, it, you, there's not even there's nothing to do with the U.S. Okay. U.S. is not there. They didn't fight the war in the way. All right, let's move they on. Up, they want to voice. And how do you 
Look at it, go to me, yeah. All right, Dan, you got a question, go ahead. Yeah, I got a question. Go uh, Charlie, Charlie, I yeah. got a question. Uh, you know that America, of course, didn't help Russia defeat the Nazis, but a lot of American companies helped the Nazis, like GE, Coca-Cola, the Chase Bank gave loans to Krupp and, uh, and Farben. Krupp was a German company. The yeah, they were German companies that American banks helped. Did America help? Forget the, IBM. IBM helped a lot. Who do you think was involved in the five-year programs? That they invited the American corporations to come in and help them build their industry. Didn't you know that? Didn't you yeah, know? Well, is that are they were the American? All right. My question is: My question is: Should the American Corporations like Chase. Let me ask my question, Charlie. Thanks. So, well, were Chase Bank when they helped uh, Germany in nineteen from nineteen forty one to nineteen forty five, or Coca Cola or I uh, IBM? Would should they be called criminals? Corporation criminals? Yes or no? Answer the question. They were already in Russia. They had oh, in China. I mean, talking about Germany. Well, I'm not a fascist. Okay. What? The, the, listen, the communists invited the U.S. corporations to come in. They were a country that was coming from peasant nothing. What? Seven, 15 million. So they, like good communists, said, Let's improve things. And they said, said we'll like people with know how, American industrialists. There, I forget there's a whole list of them, most notably Henry Ford, who showed them they helped them build um, an assembly line. They wanted tractors. They didn't want cars. They wanted tractors. They later converted those to making things. One reason the Russians had more T-34s than Tiger tanks is because they were built on an assembly line that had been shown and installed by Americans. And the Germans were still building it in place. I'm not a, I'm not a German fan. So yeah, if you collaborate with the enemy, I just say, well, I care. Yeah. Well, they're devils. All right. Okay. Go, 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 go ahead. Uh, yeah. The, you know, what has come out since then that about the deep state and, you know, why, a big question is why did Russia not finish the, or Germany finish the job and go after England and, you know, France and things. And what they're, what is coming out is that Hitler had a deal with the king of France, or that had the step down, King George or Edward or whatever, with Wallace Simpson, that they had a plan with England that they would become fascist. And in many ways, England and America and has got a kind of fascism now. Like read the book, you know, about fascism and the new age. We, so, you know, fascism isn't just Hitler. It was, it's still here. You know, it's just invisible. A lot of the same, you know, and the agreements were there at the end of World War II, you know, to um, have a leave behind army What's of, of NATO. I have no idea. Listen, man, listen, you began, you began with England. And the there was no, there was no, there was no presence of fascism or Nazism in Great Britain after the war. There was no, that is invalid assertion. Yeah. No present. Matter of fact, that's when Great You're Britain and nationalized their industries, Even, their railroads. They got socialized they medicine. Your research is yeah. not sensical. You, know you, you just Britain. said there was something to make Germany, Great Britain, did not 
Okay. The facts of the matter is, Let's Great go. Britain All right. was Let's... not with socialist. All right, Charlie. They had socialized medicine after no, the war. Charlie, let's they move on. Okay, the there's no fascism in the Germany. The war, All right, right? let's move on. The there were no fascists the in Germany. Right. Okay, the Kelvin. All right, oh, Kelvin, you got a question. I had a feeling you had your hand up or something. Somebody said something in the chat. So uh, if you want to unmute, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, you got to unmute, Kelvin. Unmute, Kelvin. Kelvin, you got to unmute. Well, how about you? Yeah, what about All right, we'll wait till you're done. All right, Kelvin, we can see your hand, but you're muted. All right, Russ. Uh, when it came to. Oh, hang on. Hang on. All right, hold on. Okay, yeah, all right. Uh, I get the basic idea of communism in the set in the form of the Soviet Union. And um, let's not forget China as well in that in the battle against Japan. Um, the Fifth Star March, et cetera, et cetera. Do you not think it was more the general idea of communism? That we've gotten from that experience. The, the, the fact that pretty much both our countries were using some form of socialism to defeat the Axis powers. You know, there was um, there was the, the conscription of labor uh, and of and of forces for the armed forces. There was um, hey, Kelvin, what's your the, question? Please. The question is, do you not think it was more of a general thing no. rather than specifically Stalin's communism? Go ahead, Charlie. Because there's no eyes He's trying to say that there was some socialism in the United States yeah. in the conduct of the war, which I find no evidence. During the war. During the war. There was, there, there were, all strike legal actions were held in abeyance during the duration of the war. If, if you were a woman, you could, be, if you were a woman you could be directed to an aircraft factory to work, right? You could be, you could, you know, if, if you were a guy, you could be, you know, if you weren't fit enough to serve in the armed forces, you could be directed towards some other, uh, other occupation with, with war orientated. All right. Um, you couldn't be a florist, put it that way. I don't. I don't see any evidence or no understand your direction. Okay, Kelvin, asking. we're gonna have to move on, all right? Okay. Thanks. All right, who's next? Here. Go ahead. We didn't hear Russ's question. He wants to talk. But I was just gonna say, Russia has, has never had a really, you act like the Russian army is so strong that it defeated Germany, but they've always had a bad military. Even today, they came and beat this little Ukraine. And uh, I, I know people in Germany in the army and they said they were all drunk, all these uh, uh, Russian soldiers. What? The greatest. Well, what? who won the war? United States won the war. They World War II? Yeah. No, they weren't even there. United United States. States. Where, where, where? United States. One fall at a time. All right, one fall at a time, guys. All right, how do you win a war? They won the war. They were there. They fought hundreds of thousands of troops. No, the Can you see the photos? What, you where, 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 what, what history books are you reading? Of course they were there. Hey, I showed you dozens of photos. All right, now who's Did you see? Wait a minute. I showed one photo. How many photos did I show? A hundred photos? I showed one, one photo at the start of the landing ground. It was the so Russian, one out of 99. It was the Russian winner that beat the, uh, Germany, not, the, not so much the, the Russian, Russian winner. The winter, winter. Oh, 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 that's a contributing right. factor. Oh, yeah, right. Right. Contributing factor to the war, that's all. Yeah. Yeah. And so is mod and bus and this and technology among the list of 100, but not by any means. That was one year. One year of the war. After that, it wasn't an issue. What about the bomb? They're not even 
That was not an issue after 19... What, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? Why? We don't want to honor us. They're not socialists like you. In World War II, I mean, come on. What the war? What you didn't see what happened? There were four hundred and fifty thousand American soldiers. And who did they fight for? What? I mean, now I don't disagree with a lot of what you're saying, but I can't just. Who won? Who won? Plus, it's twenty-five million. I'm not diminishing that guy. Wait a minute. Hey, let me finish. I have my time, Bill. I'm not diminishing your efforts, but now let's have consummate efforts. You don't want to give recognition. I, I'll give you some to anybody, no one who challenges. 25 million civilians all walks of life. And their land, wait a minute, their land was ravaged. And you come here and you say, we lost. Half a million. That's commendable. It's we not have a million. But of are you numbers, saying, did at any it's point, at any point, did I discredit? Did I discredit? Did I, will you let me finish? At any point, at any point, wait a minute. There are many people who fought. There are people, I, I'm a, uh, actually, actually an expert on the French underground, soldiers of the night. A lot of people were involved in the conflict. You cannot match any of them, not to diminish your efforts. All right. Every effort, everyone right. is wonderful, but you find they lost that many in a day. In a day. One little. But come on. All right. Well, come now, on. don't just dismiss. No, you're trying to elevate it. Right. The and then, like the guy said, he said, Are you ever going to fight this? What's his question? Are you ever going to fight this war? I'm sorry, let's move on. You ever going to fight this war? Apparently, let's move on. We'll show it up. Well, okay. Um, what, what about. Uh, 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 you said you've spoken a couple of times. So it's behind them. Okay, somebody else asked a question. What about the Japanese, the Pacific area? India, everybody, 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 everybody. Those are fascism. I thought the topic was fascism. It is fascism. Japanese are fascism. No, that's not fascism. They were, they were not fascists. No, they weren't. That's not the topic is fascism, communism. So you're talking about other wars? Yeah, there were other people fought, but they weren't. All right. Communist. One at a time, please. They weren't communists or fascists. I think you're right. Well, there were all kinds of wars. What about the Russian war crimes? Where they raped all those German women. One at a time, please. Offices. The German war crimes. I know, I know Germany had more crimes, but they had more crimes too. German passport. Well, they both were still on the Okay. I think now that we, uh, Charlie, you want to answer? Uh, war crimes are, you, you, you have the wrong definition of a war crime. No, 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 that's not a war crime. No. War crime is. is 5,000. No, 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 no. Yeah, a war crime. Okay. Well, I think it's war, time. War crime. War crime is is uh, killing captives, uh, prisoners. That's that's war crime. All right. See, we got less than an hour left. We're gonna go to rebuttals now. And uh, yeah, and I think I think we're gonna let everybody read. But now I'd like out of me, buddy. Wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Can I just say one? You were talking about what the Russians may have done to the German population. What do you think happened when the Einsatzgruppen or the Germans took over a village? What do you think happened? Yeah, I know the German. No, no, no. Tell me what happened. What the I answered that to their own people. Tell me what right? happened. And I answered that Stalin did a lot of that. Uh, the German uh, was, 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 was,
Yeah, that's every you. village they stopped yeah. in, they treated the people like shit, and they wanted to know where are your Jews? And then they would line the Jews up and execute them. Then they'd move on to the next village. And on and on and on. And a German soldier wrote a letter home and he said, we stop at a, at a Russian village and we kill all the Jews. Then we go to another Russian village and we kill all the Jews. Well, you're entirely correct. I didn't want to get into this negative aspect, but he's insisted on this. Not only did not only did they kill uh, Jewish people, people of a nationality, I believe they also killed people from the general population, alleged communists, the village with her mayor, or whatever. Excuse me, Miss, can I get a cup of coffee? Miss, no coffee for the coffee, please. Okay. All right, and that. So well, let's not get into that. All those right. Kind of aspects of it. That's an unpleasant thing. But um, yeah, there's unfortunate things. There's no, there's no justification for mistreatment of civilians. Can you answer your question? All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, they, they, they came out of war. War does things, I don't, I don't want to apologize, but war does things to people. You know. Okay, let's move on to, the, all right, Charlie, are you done? Because we're going to move on to rebuttals. Well, I'm not chairing the meeting. All right, we're going to move on to rebuttals. Uh, Who has got a rebuttal in here? One. All right, thank you. Two. Let's thank Charlie for speaking tonight. There's yeah. three of you. I got four. Anybody nice. online giving a rebuttal? Anybody online giving a All right. All right, let's move on. Uh, I'm going to give the first rebuttal myself. And I'm going to do a quick right. screen share with everybody here real quick because I got something. See, Russia may have lost the war, but Russia did do something else too that was quite that they did something else that was quite uh, applicable. I think eventually the Americans won it, as well as capitalism. If he thought that uh, that uh, zoo, that the uh, that the American capitalists did not win the war, I think that uh, I think that he's he's sadly mistaken. I'm going to show you a very brief, very quick. Uh, slideshow that I presented up real quick on just what I thought of uh, Charlie's people saying that uh, the capitalists won the war. And we're going to get to that in just a second, as soon as I can log in and share my screen here real quick. Uh, all right. You see, uh, we'll start from the beginning here at the slideshow. And uh, give me just a second real quick, please, so I go full screen. Sorry about the, all the technology starts tonight, but you know, even though communists won, it was a capitalist that won the peace. Scrooge himself was a capitalist, and what he did directly benefited the poor by providing essential services to others by having a business servicing the needs of the marketplace. Even Elmer Fudd knows this. <laughs> Will somebody explain why the elves have returned yet? But I want to stay in business. How can I do it? Business? Well, let me explain it this way. A manufacturer who sticks to old equipment cannot compete and must fail to survive he must persuade people to risk savings in his business. He can then buy equipment, increase production, and show a profit. And he keeps the profit. Oh no, that's what a lot of people think. 
but he doesn't. Out of profit, he must pay dividends to investors. Profit must be put back into the business to buy newer and better machinery. Spend his profit on machinery? Oh, when does it all end? It never ends. Constant replacement with the latest machinery makes the industry more efficient, thus enabling it to pay higher wages and still make a profit. This efficient operation also results in more goods of better quality and produces them at a lower cost to everyone. And as you can see, Scrooge was actually an altruistic character, unlike yeah. Charlie. He did he did not need the ghost. He simply needed to understand his role as an entrepreneur. No, no one. And of course, he was an honest businessman, but he was no fool. In other words, he didn't buy into the socialistic arguments like Charlie did. Yes, the communists may have cost an awful lot in their country, and the Russian sacrifice for World War II does remain. But that doesn't excuse Mr. Stalin from the 30 million people he killed and put into slavery to run his own country. And that's all I gotta say. All right, you're next. Well, it's not all I have to say. All right. Go ahead, David, you got the next rebuttal. Thank you. All right. First of all, I agree with much of what Charlie said, but not all of it. The idea that the Soviet Union fought the war alone is horseshit, plain and simple. It was a team effort by the Soviets, by the by us, by the British, and by the British Commonwealth, and also by other allies, including the Great French. Yeah. One fool at a time, Charlie. You had your time. Sit down there and be quiet. You might act, sit down and be quiet, Charlie. You might actually learn something. Thank you, David. All right, if I may continue, number one, you ignore the tremendous effort that the United States made to supply the Soviet Union and Great Britain and our other allies with tons and tons of lend-lease supplies, including uniforms, armored ar vehicles, aircraft, and ready to eat in the food and and the foodstuffs. That's number one. Number two, Britain is not actually because it was fighting for its own very life. And at one time it was fighting alone while the while the German Russians were doing nothing. So that's number two. Number three, we do those people who said, well, why did the Russians get involved in the war in the first place? They got involved because Hitler invaded their country, plain and simple. And as Winston Churchill himself, no friend of the Soviet Union said, he pointed out that he had been an anti-communist all his life, that he had, that he would say no word, uh, 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 that he would say, <clears throat> unsay no word that he had said about it. But that essentially, the Germans had no right to invade another country. Period, end of story. Secondly, the Western allies were busy fighting. The United States was busy fighting as early as November in 1942 when we did the first landings in North Africa. And we are observing the 80th anniversary of that, of Operation Torch this, this, this very month. And we, that ignores the war that we fought against the Japanese. And why did we fight the war against the Japanese? One, because they made league with Hitler, plain and simple. They were part of the three-part axis that included the Germans and the Italians, as well as the Japanese. And the Japanese adopted the same fascist solution. And if they couldn't get what they wanted at the peace table, they were going to march in and take it, which is exactly what the Nazis did and what exactly what the Italians did when they invaded Ethiopia. And we fought a two-front war. And I would say rather that the contributions made by the armed forces of all the allies, including but not limited to the Russians, should all be honored and remembered, plain and simple. And it was a, and it was a team effort. And that's something that thank you. Remember that teamwork gets things done. It's how you get legislation through Congress. It's how you get positive results from the U.S. government. Said everybody's busy, busy playing gotcha these days. That they've forgotten how to do that. Thank you. 
Thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Charlie. That was interesting. I did, you know, but I think what it's missing is uh, the untold story of American empire. And, um, you know, if you watch the Oliver Stone series, uh, books like this one, this is one of my favorite, Black Terror, White Soldiers, <coughs> Fascism and the New Age by David Livingstone. That really it is us. <coughs> we, we need an enemy. I think what, when you say, you know, fascism versus communism, America is more of a fascist country, but we've kept it hidden. It's invisible. We backed Hitler in many ways. Our Wall Street, CIA, FBI, they were all designed to, to suppress the labor movement that the communists in America, the wobblies that we've had people come here, you know, they did a great job of that. You know, in the 30s, the wobblies were huge and the labor was huge and got a lot of the things, you know, communism was huge. And then after the war, we end up with, you know, our government, people with McCarthy, you know, putting people on blacklists, um, funding, and we really did fund, the, the turn the whole thing on Stalin. I mean, it, it's, I was reading today about, it, well, one, it's, about how James Bond, the real James Bond story, is that they helped get um, Martin Bormann and all the Nazi gold out and put it into the Swiss banks, you know, but what, what we have is a form of propaganda, and we still have it. It's total deception. All the media that we have and including like your talk is looking at only, you know, this Hollywood view of, of fascism and communism. And it, what the truth is communism can't beat fascism until we acknowledge that, you know, fasc, that what fascism is, which is Wall Street. It's, it's you know, um, the new, you know, social media, big tough tech. It's a monopoly. You know, the best way to fight fascism was Ida Tarbell and people that, you know, try, put in regulations, antitrust laws that would, you know, keep Rockefeller, call Rockefeller out for providing the, the standard oil that kept the planes going, Hitler's planes going, kept Hitler's blick reach going, you know, that there, we've just got to tell the truth. And that also gets into what's coming out now is that the, you know, the Holocaust was horrible and real, but it, that a lot of Hitler worked with the Zionism to manufacture, bring about Italy, and then bring about the the war, the forever war that we're in now. You know, we're on on the Muslims, on the on the you know, we have to have an end. Is if you look at the Bray documentary, everything is a rich man's trick. That you know. It, the truth is America needs an enemy and it's amazing how quickly we turned on and made this war on communism that resulted in us putting forts and all over the country, which really are torture sites. We implemented the worst aspects of Nazi fascism, killing thousands in, in you know, Nicaragua and Iran and, uh, you know, Indonesia. We have taken over the world and through occupying Look at, you know, the hitman. Um, I was a hitman for America. Look at, um, you know, the, the truth is we use the World Bank and the IMC to go in there and exploit countries all over the world and, and take everything they have. And we assassinate them. We, are, we have the greatest assassination squad in the world in what was the CIA. This is 1948, right? The CIA. The, the special forces, if a, if a person in South America, a democratically elected president, Allende, says, I, you know, no, I don't want to 
we're going to keep our own oil. We're going to we're going to pay our own people. We're going to be you know self-supporting socialist, communist, democratic, republican. You know, self-supporting. We kill them if they don't take our deal to give. Let us have the oil. Let us have the resources. That's fascism. You know, and also if you listen to um, Hedges, Chris Hedges, was reading about inverted totalitarianism. The best way to define fascism is this that kind of corrupt managerial dirty tricks that we have with our invisible intelligence agencies running everything. That's all I got. Okay. All right, uh, Jake, if you want to go next, go ahead. Anybody? I got a, I got a question. Yeah, I got a question for the last speaker. You said something about something about the Nazis. Uh, the, the Nazis collaborating with the Zionists? What do you mean? Okay, yeah, that's, it's uh, on YouTube, but mainly um, well, Berea, but there's, it's coming out, well, really, you know, Rothschild Bank really created the state of Israel. And this went back to Balfour and Rothschild and uh, Bergman and the, um, a lot of what happened in the Ukraine the um, pale, you know, there's a lot of uh, collaboration uh, with that, but this creation, the state of Israel really is, uh, it, they, the worst of it is the fascism is the king of, you know, the crown of England. And it's this kind of invisible, well, the Mossad is really behind a lot of yeah, but it's America's- nothing to, nothing to do with- it's not, Nothing to do with- it's nothing. It's nothing, it's to, nothing do. to do. It's, it's not nothing. Judaism. It's nothing to There's do with nothing. Zionism. Hold on, it's nothing to do with Zionism. You understand? Because you well, you're not Jewish, yeah. you cannot I'll say that. Political yeah, Zionism. You're wrong. Yeah, Dumb we'll, we'll, we'll give a talk on that, you know, with all the details. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay, enough, enough. Yeah. This is this is consp conspiracy theories yeah, and it doesn't yeah. make any sense. I just want to. I just want to say. I, I just want to say. Can I? Can I? Can I? Can I, can I finish? I just want to say. I, I. I agree. I. I agree with one of the previous speakers. Uh, Stalin could could not have possibly won the war on his own. Well, yeah, it was a collapse. It was a. It was a collapse. It was. Uh, it was. Can I? Can I finish? Stalin couldn't. Stalin got into the war because his country was invaded. But uh, he could have not. He could not, not have possibly won the war by. Yeah, we know, by we know that. Was, point of fact. Was, that, point of fact. Hitler's first solution was depopulation. Uh, Jake, we're going to have to cut the crosstalk off. Which, which falls directly into Zionism. And we got more rebutters coming, so we're going to have to cut off the crosstalk at this point. Okay, Margaret. You okay. Got, uh, you unmute and go ahead. Margaret, go ahead. You're, you're, you're next. Uh, just a little bit in line with what Ellen was saying, an excellent book, Greg Grandin's Empire's Workshop, Latin America, the United States, and the making of an imperial republic. The United States has honed its capabilities of manipulation, unfortunately, in Latin America, often, in my opinion, uh, using democracy as a euphemism for its support of capitalism. But he's just very insightful and, of course, very disturbing. So I thought all of you would enjoy that for your bedtime reading or your bedtime misery. Uh, what is it again, Margaret? The title. And then we'll go next to COVID. The title is, it's by Greg Grandin. And he has written a number of these books, uh, probably all, you know, on the same wavelength. This one specifically, and it's an update, there was an older version, Empire's Workshop, Latin America, the United States, and the making of an imperial republic. Yeah. Okay. Next. All right. Next, uh, Kelvin, you had uh, indicated your hand to speak. Yeah. Um, I'd, uh, first, I'd like to go say, not I don't know, the, the guy that was on before, the one that said it was a team effort. Um, I don't think more, better words were said. Um, it was not just a team effort in terms of participating nations. It was a team effort in terms of ideologies. We talk in very absolute terms about capitalism and socialism, communism and libertarianism, etc. 
the fact is, is that most societies tend to work on the gray areas, mixed economies. We know that unfettered capitalism leads to gated communities and shanty towns and corrupt politicians and et cetera, et cetera. We know that a complete totalitarian system leads to a very gray, dull Soviet, and at worst, murderous state. We try and balance it between the two. We try and use the best systems for the job. So when it came, so for after you were talking after the war, now after the war, Europe, it was certainly West Germany was in tatters. Uh, the Marshall Plan was introduced. American money was put in to revitalize the industry. But also because we cannot be reliant upon three ghosts to make the employees do the right thing. Unions were re reintroduced into, into Germany, but they, they, they sent over union experts from Britain, like people like Vic Feathers and Nye Bevan, you know, uh, staunch uh, trade union socialists. And they, and they formulated unions in Germany that if you worked in a car industry for Mercedes or BMW, whatever, you were a car worker. You weren't a pipe fitter, you weren't a, uh, an engineer, you weren't an upholsterer. You, if you swept the floor or drew pictures in the office, you were a car worker and you had that kind of clowns. But also you had all the differential sorted out by the unions as well. So the management didn't have to really do much but say, we made this much this year, that's some that much we can afford to buy and work out from that. The result is, Mercedes now owns Chrysler. We're not talking about absolute systems here. We're talking about degrees. Okay. All right, Kelvin, thanks a lot. We got another rebutter on station. So uh, go ahead and uh, you got another rebutter here and uh, please introduce yourself when you get on onto the microphone. All right. Me, uh, go, go ahead. Uh, me or someone on Zoom? No, well, me? Right. yeah, you're you're next. So uh, I'm Adam Balling. I've been here a few times. My daughter has been here once, about three years ago, when I was giving a presentation uh, about a man who lived through these years in Hungary and then uh, lived through the communist regime in Hungary thereafter. Uh, made his career as an economist. So I do have some familiarity with the war in Eastern Europe and on the Eastern Front. Uh, and I agree with much of the general thrust, at least behind some of Charlie's talk, that yes, this is a story we don't, in the United States, tend to know as much. If you look at the different documentary channels on cable, I mean, there's an awful lot of output about D-Day compared to about Stalingrad or Kursk. And I know, because I used to watch all those TV shows that I could find, and they'd be you know, much less frequent for the coverage of the war in the Eastern Front. Uh, now that said, I think there was um, probably a lot of the thrust of Charlie's talk that I would disagree with. Um, and I apologize if I missed anything while I was helping my daughter in the restroom uh, that he may have covered. Um, the degree to which Stalin was already conniving to carve up Eastern Europe. I think it's something that doesn't start with his career, but I mean, in September of 39, they've just concluded the Nazi-Soviet pact in August. They invade Poland a few weeks apart and carve it up. For the next two years almost, oh, the menus fell again. Uh, for the next two years, Evelyn, back in your chair. Um, for the next two years, uh, you know, he's invading other Eastern European countries, invading Finland, or, or I should say the USSR is invading them. Uh, it's not a very attractive look. And then quite stupidly, no. ignoring British warnings uh, in the spring and early summer of 1941, that there is, the, the Wehrmacht is amassing, you know, foreign invasion with the response that, ah, that's what you capitalists would want me to think if you wanted me to fight your war. So we were treated tonight to the kind of, uh, you know, 
if we are used to, if you will, the Hollywood version in America, we got kind of the Russian equivalent of that to some extent uh, tonight. <laughs> now, the, the indecency of these, this is the other thing that we're used to the heroic version of thinking about this. And, you know, there's the uglier side of the British Empire. There's the uglier side of the American Empire, whether we want to call it that or not. Uglier side of the Soviet Empire. Um, we can see this in, with roots going back to World War I with the sort of six-sided war, I think, in Ukraine at the end. Uh, and there were already pro-German Ukrainians in 1917 and 18, not for Nazi reasons, but you know, collaborating with the German Empire on their way in. And all sorts of unsavory activity through the Cold War years, uh, whether it's you know US allies or upstarts. Someone had mentioned Nicaragua earlier. Danny Ortega is back in power, and he's a bigger dictator than ever. Uh, and there's no Soviet Union, you know, to prop him up anymore. So he's capable of learning these lessons and continuing them on his own. Um, anyhow, uh, I thought it was mostly interesting as a Russian World War II, you know, Eastern Front history lesson. The sort of part one, part two, you know, seemed a, a much weaker connection, maybe a bit more facetious. Uh, whether you're talking about the infiltrators uh, in government or conflating, which we're not supposed to do, right? Isn't it McCarthyistic for us to conflate AOC and Joseph Stalin or something like that? Like, wouldn't that be kind of silly? Now, uh, to my table mate, I, I wanted to say this. Um, Ellen, the abdication crisis was a couple of years before the war. So, and there was a new there were changes in the British prime ministers and all of that stuff between when Edward the what's his name? Edward the Eighth. Eighth, thank you. Three years before the war. Yeah, he, he gave up rather earlier. Um, and I believe, again, it is fair to say, uh, the late, I think it was Christopher Hitchens who wrote about this, that the King's speech was itself sort of Hollywoodized in various ways. Uh, and that Churchill was anti-abdication but he would, you know, he, you know, because he just thought, well, this is an indecent thing to happen to the British people. But that they try in the Hollywood version of, of history in the King's speech to in, insinuate that Churchill is preparing the King's brother to be the anti appeasement King who will take over. But that also doesn't quite hold water because Churchill was very rare as the anti appeasement British politician. A whole generation of European politicians were traumatized by World War One and didn't want to do it again. So appeasement was very common. Uh, excuse me. Uh, on the right, on the right, the uh, the Labour Party was was always staunchly anti-fascist. Oh, thank people you. Like, uh, uh, yeah, people like Attlee and Bevan and uh, yeah, and Beveridge. Yeah. Well, they weren't in government. Oh, sorry, they weren't in the ruling cabinet. No, 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 they were in opposition. Uh, and they got to, I think you would know this better than I would as a Liverpudlian, but they also got to the benefit of being out of power. They got to play that up more after the war, like when Michael Foote wrote uh, Guilty Men. Uh, yes, yes. But, you know, but, but also, yeah, but you also. Let, let him finish. Let him finish. But, but also there were, uh, there were guys from that Labour Party. It was coalition government during the war. So there was people like Morris, uh, Morrison. And uh, you know, a better beverage, and uh, you know, and Atlee. Atlee was definitely prime minister. There were, there were by 1942, Britain had outstripped Germany in war production. Right. Yeah, the coalition government formed in the late spring or early summer of '40 after the. Yeah, 39. 39. Yeah, yeah. All right, or at least that's when Churchill became PM. Yeah, there were there were there were a few stories in uh, um, Halifax, obviously without. Um, mm -hmm. Eden, Eden was in, I think. Um, and, um, yeah, Eden I was in, uh, in and out. I mean, yeah. uh, so you uh, do, do the All right, Kelvin, we got him. And on. I'll give it to the next one. But authoritarianism comes from many sources. We know that Mussolini came from the labor syndicalist movement, and then wanted the Italian Empire to win, and we had all kinds of stuff like that. Anyhow, on to the next victim. Uh, okay, our next rebutter, please <laughs> sit down and uh, take yeah, the, 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 the tonight. Uh, 
I remember 1950, 50 sometime, in this 50s, this article I read, I don't know who the author was. He says that as time goes on with this conflict with the Soviet Union itself, that we have become, as I say, and they could become more like us. I think we see this evidence today. We see the <coughs> Soviet Union breaking down into a commercial, the commercial changes they made. Who's the China? Mind? China making their changes. And we're becoming more and more so. We see this every day in our, our everyday life. More socialism attacking us, you know, coming from the various, various elements. <clears throat> um, the world is this is sort of a conflict between uh, collectivism, where you want government to do the work for you, or you don't want government to do the work for you. You want to be independent. It's, it's, it's a battle going on everywhere. It's pretty much really engaging in the United States more and more now. And I think that, uh, my opinion, <clears throat> you got to find a blend between the two. I like to first of all say that the, yeah, yeah. the, the free enterprise system is probably the best economic system ever created for human beings. Individual, free choice, creates his own job. He's got an idea, he wants to go into something, and you got to leave that opportunity, you got to leave that door open for those people. And then again, you can have a safety net. Everybody can't do that. You need to have uh, some collectivism. Some government has to come in and help people in some cases. You just need it. Everybody can't be independent like that. Okay. Mr. Travis wants to go to it, so wrap it up. If you don't okay. Know. Well, anyway, the point is we need to find some kind of a, a meeting ground between collectivism and between free enterprise. We keep both, keep free enterprise alive. I want to keep that alive. But you need to have a safety net for. Uh... Okay. Yeah. Please go ahead. Thank you, sir. Thank you. <laughs> remember, you are being recorded and on Zoom. So. What did you say? You are being recorded. Remember. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say that when Hitler had first come to power, nobody believed that he was going to be as aggressive as he was. Winston Churchill saw the handwriting on the wall and he warned Great Britain and everyone else that he could that this guy is a maniac and he's going to really do destruction. They thought Winston Churchill was nuts. When that guy Neville Chamberlain came back to England, waving that paper that he signed with Hitler, saying now there will be peace in our time, he didn't know that Hitler had already sent troops to war, so that it made a complete fool out of him. Neville Chamberlain, I understand, was a uh, was with the Liberal Party. Well, what? Well, after that happened, and like I say, Mr. Churchill had been warning everyone, then the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor. Nobody liked Winston Churchill because he was from rich people. And in England, they didn't like rich capitalist people, even though Winston Churchill had his entire family fortune had been wiped out with the depression. Winston Churchill was trying very hard to become prime minister. And when Japan bombed Pearl Harbor, Churchill gave a speech and he said, can they believe that we would sit back and do nothing? I say to you, the combined might of the allies must be brought to bear upon them until they have been taught a lesson that they shall never forget. With this speech, Churchill rode his way to being the prime minister and 
doing what it took to make England victorious. Uh, and a bit, a bit out on the time layer that time on that battle chart. We realized together the U.S., Russia. You're, you're a bit out on your timeline. And England. We all worked together. No, no, the, the war started in 1939, darling. Not, 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 Churchill came for this prime minister in 39, not 41. Who's doing that That's Calvin. That's Calvin in the background here. He's uh all right. No, it was, a, no, it was historically inaccurate. Sorry. Oh, Churchill did not become prime minister in 40 when, when, Jap when, when Japanese invasion uh, hit Poil Arbor. Churchill became prime minister after the after the fall of Poland oh, and during the fall of France. Kelvin, we got it. We got to move on. So, Charlie, go ahead. All right. I think you are. Final think, remarks from Charlie. So, go ahead. I think we've advanced from point A to point B. I've got a bit of history. Uh, I've also heard some missed history. I'll call it missed history. Um, I illustrate an example here where the. Um, Three minutes, Charlie. The, Germans sent in 80% of their military force into this conflict. And you say, well, we were in the war too. So in essence, using that mathematically, the Allied Britain and the United States and the France that were in Polish exile were fighting 20% of the German army. And you claim, well, it took the united effort. Well, the Russians were fighting the other 80%. And then you give an example of how you fought. And you say, well, we sent canned goods. Well, a lot more than that, Charlie. I guess. Well, in that battle, I saw a Russian soldier. I saw a guy with a Russian gun, Russian made bullets, a Russian tank. I also saw young people from Russia fighting young people, children, picking up arms, fighting. And you come along and you say, you want equal credit? This is the biggest battle. I outlined it. It took a span of about 30 days. I'm not aware, I've never encountered the presence of anybody from the United States being there. Okay. The biggest battle in the history of mankind, you weren't there, and yet you claim you were part of the conflict. You just, I guess, took the day off. All right, Charlie, let's kind of wrap it up now, okay? All right. Thank you. All right. All right. As of right now, we're going to cut off the College of Complexes for recording. Kelvin, would you mind taking the host controls of the Zoom call if you'd like to? Yeah, uh, yeah, fine, yeah. All right. And then with this, I'm going to say, and the recording, and then Kelvin, you're going to take the uh, controls. And you yeah, guys... I don't have to do anything. All right. Uh, just give me a few minutes, and uh, we'll be ready. Do and I have to do anything? Ten for attending the College of Complexes.